Can I just, to kick off, ask how many people in this room identify as having arthritis? Okay, great, about two-thirds of you. I, I think a lot of my colleagues are underplaying it. How many people identify as being old? <laughs> okay. <laughs> catching up, Professor Lofton is catching up. So oh, only about half. So that's, that's interesting. I think we've got the right people here because arthritis is very common. Some of us identify as, as aging and being old, but more information is needed to understand why we age at different rates, to predict who will age at particular rates, and for us to achieve the outcome which we all want, which is healthy aging, living well to a longer age and enjoying life. Okay? So without any further ado, it gives me great pleasure to hand over to my, my friend and colleague, John Laughlin. He's a professor in the Institute of Genetic Medicine, and he is the Newcastle lead for SEMA, the Centre for Integrated Musculoskeletal Aging, and he will explain everything that you need to know about SEMA. Thank you, Fraser. Um, so I'm somebody that self-identifies as old. Um, which my group uh, would agree to, I think. Yeah, but perhaps not so much in this audience, I think. But my arthritis actually is beginning to develop. I play a bit of football and stuff like that. So I'm beginning to develop that as well. So I'm going to talk to you about the uh, work that SEMA does. So the first thing, SEMA stands for the Center for Integrated Research into Musculoskeletal Aging. It's a grant that's funded by the Medical Research Council and also by Arthritis Research UK and it involves three universities in the north. That's Liverpool, Sheffield, and also Newcastle. So just some background about SEMO. SEMO was first funded in 2012. We had a five-year grant, and that was funded to the value of 2.5 million by the MRC and Arthritis Research UK, and then we got one million from our universities. And then it was renewed in 2017 for another five years. So this is the ongoing work that we're doing right now, and that was 2 million and 0.7 from our universities. So if you think about why these universities, what was it that brought us together? Well, if you think about our joints, there's lots of tissues in our joints. So there's things like cartilage, muscle, bone, other tissues as well, such as ligaments and tendons. And what we noticed is when we were putting the grant together for the first time, some of our universities have particular strengths in particular tissues. So Newcastle has a lot of expertise in the biology of cartilage, Liverpool in the biology of muscle, and Sheffield in the biology of bone. So that's what kind of brought us all together. So we wanted to be able to do research into the whole joint. And what we do is we exchange expertise between us. So those that have great expertise in bone are able to tell us something about the joint from their perspective, muscle and cartilage and so on. So it's a kind of added value between our universities. And what we're wanting to do is we're trying to understand why we age from a musculoskeletal perspective and what we can do about that. Why do we get certain diseases, so things like arthritis and also osteoporosis? And is there any means of intervening? And there's two kind of research aspects to what we do. The first one is a mechanisms and targets. So what this is, is this is a research theme where we're trying to understand from a very basic perspective what's going on in our cells, in our tissues, in our articulating joints that is causing the disease. The next thing is to think about interventions and outcomes. So what can we do about these age-related conditions, about things like arthritis? Can we actually think about intervening? So there's two core research themes within SEMA. And one of the things is that we also have underpinning activities. So we train scientists, we also train doctors, and we're training them with regards to research, understanding more about the musculoskeletal system and the research aspects to it. And we're also involved in impact and engagement. So we're interacting with patients, with members of the public, but we also interact with industry. So we try to keep industry on board. So as we develop new ideas, we can actually think about translating that uh, for future patient benefit. So those are the activities that SEMA is involved in. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus now on osteoarthritis. The reason for that is it's something that I'm particularly interested in and that my research group focuses on. And in the final session of today, you'll hear from some of the young scientists. They'll be talking to you about some of the research that they do do. So this is uh, an image taken of an osteoarthritic joint. So this is a hip joint taken from an OA patient. And if you look just here, you can see this is the total loss of the articular cartilage. This is the intact cartilage. Normally, the cartilage covers the whole of the joint. And the role of that cartilage is to ensure that you have a friction-free movement in your joint. 
when you lose the cartilage to that degree, you're exposing the underlying bone. So you can imagine that in a joint like that, you have bone rubbing against bone. And this is clearly a very painful disease. It's a, joint, it's a disease that impacts upon a large number of skeletal sites, but principally the hips, knees, and the hands. And what I'm interested in is the genetic component to osteoarthritis. So why does osteoarthritis arise? And what about when it's transmitted within families? So when parents are transmitting it to their offspring? Um, so one of the things that we first discovered is that there is a very strong genetic component to osteoarthritis. So if you were to take the population as a whole, about 50% of the occurrence of the disease is down to the genes that we inherit from our parents. But what we've discovered is it's not a single gene. So it's not one gene that you get from your mom or one gene that you get from your dad, but instead you inherit multiple risk genes. And if you inherit enough of these, you cross what we call a threshold of susceptibility and you suddenly become susceptible to developing the disease as you age. So in a way, osteoarthritis is no different to things like diabetes or asthma. We're all walking around with genes that are risk factors for those diseases. If we inherit enough of them, we will then develop those diseases. Um, the other factor that's involved is environmental triggers. So it's not just your genes. So some people will have a lot of risk genes but won't develop the disease, uh, and some people will. And we're interested in knowing what those environmental triggers are as well. So in some of the talks that will follow towards the end, you'll get some clues as to the genetic component and also some of those environmental triggers. So what do we do in SEMA with regards to osteoarthritis and genetics? Well, the first thing is we discover OA genes. The second thing is we try to identify how they affect OA risk. So why does a particular gene cause the disease to develop? And then we try and rectify the situation uh, to try and uh, deal with these detrimental effects. So when it comes to discovering OA risk genes, it's actually a very straightforward mathematical issue. What you do is you take a large number of people who have your disease of interest. So in this instance, imagine a large group of patients with knee osteoarthritis. You then take a large group of patients who uh, don't have your disease of interest, so they're disease-free. They're all from the same ethnic group. So there's no genetic difference dictated by ethnicity. The genetic difference is dictated by the occurrence of the disease. You then go through the whole human genome, so all of the genes that we carry, and you look for very subtle differences in the DNA sequence between those patients. And if your sample size is large enough, you begin to see these very subtle frequency differences. So one piece of DNA is more common in the individuals with the disease versus the individuals without, and that's indicating a risk gene. And to do these types of studies, we look at tens of thousands of osteoarthritis patients. So it's a very large scale study, but it has the power to identify these genes. The next thing we do is we try and work out what they're doing. So going back to SEMA, the multiple tissues that are in an articulating joint, one of the things we're interested in is knowing when these genes are active. So at what point during development are they active in the older person? So when somebody comes forward, for example, for hip joint replacement surgery, do we identify that these genes are active in those patients? And we're able to do this because we have strong collaborative links with orthopedic surgeons at the Freeman Hospital and at the RVI and we're able to access their patient tissues. And you'll hear a bit more about this later from Joanna, who leads on the actual access of these tissues from osteoarthritic patients. So we've created a biobank of OE tissues. So once we've identified the genes, we can then go to this biobank and we can start to analyze those genes. The next thing we want to do is to rectify the risk. So what we're doing at the moment is we're using a very novel technique called CRISPR-Cas9. So this, in essence, is an ability to edit the DNA. So we can go in, we can identify the gene, we know what it's doing, and we can then begin to alter it so that we can change the activity of that gene. And you'll hear a bit about this as well later on from Sarah. So ultimately, what we would like to do is we would like to take patients who have the disease, identify their risk genes, and then begin to think about modifying those genes and make a more resilient cartilage. So the image that I showed you earlier, where we start to lose that activity, we start to lose that cartilage, we can actually do something about that. So that's the kind of overall aim of the osteoarthritis research that's ongoing in SEMA. It's to try and get to the position where we can actually do something for patients. 
There's a wonderful SEMA website if anybody's interested. So all I've done in this particular presentation is just focus on a very small component of what's going on in SEMA. But there's uh, lots going on. You'll hear some more from Emma and also from Tom about that. Uh, but if you would like to know more about the activities that are underway, please do visit our website and uh, don't hesitate to get in touch with us. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Are there anybody with burning questions? Could I ask, um, when you actually do these tests to compare the DNA, mm -hmm. you'll obviously find other um, parts of the DNA that's going to be different. How do you know the difference between the uh, arthritic changes and maybe somebody who's going to develop diabetes at a later stage? Because we're not focused on individuals that have diabetes. So the frequency of diabetes in our arthritic patients will be the same as in our control patients because we haven't selected them for diabetes. Right, got it. Sorry. That's okay. It's a really good question. <laughs> Could I just ask, sorry, uh, maybe you can't answer this, but um, can you give um, a rough estimate of any time that, you, that may be possible to uh, have some sort of a uh, therapy? I mean, are we talking okay. 10 years, 5 uh, years? It's the, it's the normal scientific a answer on the Today program, isn't it? It's 5 to 10 years. Um, don't forget, surgery is a very good treatment for osteoarthritis. So if we had orthopedic surgeons presenting today, they would point that out to you. There's several hundred thousand done in the UK per year. Um, when it comes to the research that we're doing, realistically, we have to get to the point where we can do this safely. We can then get a license to actually apply it in patients. It's already the case that you can take cartilage, grow it up in a dish, and put it back into a patient. So that's already licensed. What we want to do is to actually alter the DNA as itself. So that's a trickier thing from a regulatory perspective to do. And we'll take quite a few years, so I'll say five to 10 years. Uh, can sorry. Ask, sorry, can I, it's supplementary, I sort of, I used to play rugby, mm -hmm. uh, and take, had a, a cartilage injury there, and had it taken out. Does that put me at increased risk? Yeah, I'm going to give this to Fraser. Yes. <laughs> it, it, essentially, if, if we look at the model of osteoarthritis, it's not a disease of wear and tear. That's not a good way of referring to it. It would be much better to think about it as a disease of tear, flare, and repair. The tear, if you rupture a ligament, if you have a shallow cup, you have congenital dysplasia of the hip, you know, if you have a structural problem, then you are much more likely to get osteoarthritis. Flare, because you get inflammation, and that's associated with pain and progression, and repair, because the body's very good at repairing, and most people who have osteoarthritis never need a hip and knee replacement. But I do have good news about the people who want to have osteoarthritis, who want treatments. There, there is evidence now, and going to be presented later this year, that one of the treatments we use for rheumatoid arthritis is effective for osteoarthritis, and there are new treatments coming through. So it's not a case of waiting the five to ten years till John's work turns into a treatment. There are other things which have been going on for that duration already, and that we can apply. It seems to me that the medical uh, profession contributed towards my possible arthritis. Did they? Sorry, what, you said you were playing rugby. Okay, so, so was it a doctor that tackled you? No, no, but it was a doctor that removed my cartilage. Oh, okay. I'd, I'd have to say, obviously John said some positive things about surgery, so let's balance it. The truth is, when we first start doing something surgically, we don't know whether it's any good, okay? So the honest surgeons will admit that, and now we have refined hip replacement so that it's become a useful thing. But the operations to take out meniscal, cartilage, that there's very good evidence now that you should not have a telescope into your knee unless you've got locking, unless it gets stuck, okay? So I think a lot of the surgery that was done in the past will not be done now, but that's the nature of, of science. It progresses. The important thing is that we collect the data and we improve things as we go. Yeah.